Electron affinity and electronegativity, the last of the periodic trends here. So we've already covered atomic radius and ionization energy in the previous lessons in this chapter. So now we'll cover these two to kind of polish it off. Now, we still will have a lesson of descriptive chemistry to finish this chapter off in the last one, but it won't involve any periodic trends. My name is Chad and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, in addition to high school and college science prep, we also have prep courses for the MCAT, the DAT, and the OAT. You can find those at chadsprep.com. Now, this lesson is part of my new general chemistry playlist. It's going to cover an entire year of general chemistry. I'll be releasing several lessons a week throughout the school year, so if you want to be notified every time I post one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. All right, so we're going to talk about electron affinity now, and uh, it turns out electron affinity is the exact opposite of ionization energy. And so ionization energy was the energy required to remove an electron. Well, now instead of losing an electron, we're going to talk about atoms gaining an electron. And whereas, you know, electrons are attracted to that nucleus and we had to pull them off an atom, you don't have to push them onto an atom. That's where they want to go, at least for gaining one, as we'll see. Uh, and so it turns out most of these are going to be exothermic instead of endothermic. So if we take a look at chlorine here, and again, everything is going to happen in the gaseous phase, just like ionization energy. But now we've got an electron as a reactant, so we can form an anion instead. And this is the chemical reaction we use to describe uh, electron affinity here. And it turns out, again, that these are typically exothermic. There are exceptions. We'll learn where those exceptions lie and why they are. So, but it turns out chlorine has the most negative electron affinity of all the elements. So it will release the most energy out of them all. And so it turns out it's negative 349 kilojoules per mole. Uh, and so you give chlorine an electron and it will shower you with energy. So super happy to receive that electron. So you're like, well, shoot, <laughs> you know, I just made chlorine's day by giving him an electron. You know, I'm going to go give one to argon. And you go to give an electron to argon and argon punches you in the face. Argon doesn't want your electron. So if we look over here, argon is one of these exceptions. So argon's got a filled octet. He does not want an electron. He's like, I'm good the way I am. Don't change me. I didn't want to lose an electron. So for ionization energy, really high ionization energies for those noble gases, but he doesn't want to gain one either. And so notice he actually has a positive electron affinity. He does not want to gain an electron. That's typical for the noble gases, but they're not alone. We find out that the exceptions for those who didn't want to lose electrons are also going to be some exceptions for those who don't want to gain electrons as well. And so it turns out for the filled S subshell, and that's going to include like beryllium, magnesium, calcium, so on and so forth, uh, they also tend to have positive or maybe just very slightly negative electron affinity. So magnesium doesn't want your electron either. He's got a filled S subshell. He'd like to just stay that way. He wouldn't want to, he doesn't want to gain that electron in the P orbital. And it turns out we could talk about like screening or shielding as playing a role in this too. So, but even the half-filled P subshells are going to violate the trend here as well. Notice we go from negative 43 to negative 134, and then skip past phosphorus here, and it would be negative 200, negative 349. He doesn't fit the trend. He's at negative 72, so he's still negative, so, but not in line with the rest of the trend. And so, turns out for the half-filled P subshells, they're going to be either just slightly negative or sometimes even positive as the case might be for like nitrogen or something like that. So, uh, so the exceptions lie in the same places uh, that they did for ionization energy in the group two metals with a filled S subshell and the half filled P subshells. But now we should really look at the noble gases as being exceptions as well. And so part of the general trend for ionization energy, they were just going to increase going over towards uh, the noble gases anyways for removing an electron. Well, now when we say increasing ionization energy, we actually mean getting more negative and it doesn't get more negative when you go from the halogens so to those noble gases. So definitely a violation. We have to treat it as an exception now, along with, again, the filled S and the half-filled P. Cool. Now, it turns out there's not a well-defined vertical trend. So all we're going to say is that it increases going to the right for electron affinity. And again, when we say increases, we have to be careful because what we really mean is it gets more negative. And so a lot of professors realize that's confusing. And so instead of saying increasing, they will often say increasing, i.e. gets more negative. They'll kind of qualify that or they'll just say gets more negative. Now, technically though, the terminology does say increasing and you're supposed to interpret increasing for electron affinity as getting more negative. So uh, word to the wise there. Now, if we look again, there's no well-defined vertical trend. So it turns out that chlorine here in period number three 
on the periodic table has the most negative electron affinity. And it turns out the period three elements in general have some of the most negative electron affinities. And so it generally gets more negative as you approach that third period, either from the top down or from the bottom up. And we can see that here with the halogen. So negative 328 less negative than negative 349. But we can also see that going up towards chlorine in the third period, it's also getting more negative that way as well. And so because there's no well-defined trend, like just up or just down, uh, we often don't even teach students this. So I'm gonna put this out there for the few of you that maybe need to know this. Maybe you need to know that period three has the highest values or something, the most negative values uh, or something like that. Um, but odds are most of you are probably just gonna learn one big trend that it increases going to the right. And again, increasing means gets more negative. And then finally, you still gotta know where those exceptions lie. So that's the general trend for electron affinity. So, and just like with ionization energy, we can also talk about successive electron affinities as well. And so the trend we've just learned only applies to the first electron affinity. So let's talk about successive electron affinities. And, uh, and before we do that though, I just wanna tell you a lie here. And so let's say we've got something like sodium and oxygen. So we're gonna talk about sodium and oxygen forming a happy couple. And so here, sodium here is going to lose electrons and become sodium ions. Oxygen's going to gain electrons to become the oxide ion, and we're gonna form sodium oxide. And so we can see here in sodium oxide that sodium now is plus one, and that oxygen there is minus two. Now, the lie we like to tell students is that, well, sodium wanted to lose those electrons so that we'd have a, a filled octet in the previous shell, and then oxygen wanted to gain those electrons so that he would have a filled octet. And there's two lies in that. So first lie is that sodium doesn't want to lose electrons. If you recall, losing electrons is ionization energy, and that's going to cost energy. Now, if you've got to pick somebody to lose electrons, well, I mean, the alkali metals are your best choice. They have the lowest ionization energies. But again, to say that they want to lose an electron is not quite true because it's still gonna cost energy. Cool, now the other lie here is gonna deal with oxygen because oxygen doesn't need to gain just one electron, it needs to gain two because the oxide ion has a negative two charge and that's where things are gonna get a little funny here. So we can have oxygen gas gaining an electron to turn into the oxygen anion, and then we can take that oxygen anion, gaining another electron to turn into the oxide ion. All right, so we've got these two successive electron affinities, and uh, again, electron affinities tend to be exothermic besides those exceptions, and oxygen's not one of those exceptions, and so when oxygen gains that first electron, turns out it's negative 141 kilojoules per mole. Cool, so nothing wrong here. So problem we have though, is that once oxygen gains an electron, he's negatively charged. And so you have this negatively charged ox, uh, oxygen anion here, wanting to gain another negatively charged electron. We have a problem, they're both negative and they're gonna repel each other. And nobody wants to gain more than one electron. So in this case, it turns out that successive electron affinities are not negative. They're not exothermic, they're gonna be endothermic. And probably pretty significantly so. And in this case, it's actually positive 744 kilojoules per mole. And so to say that oxygen actually wanted to gain electrons is definitely not true. It wanted to gain the first one, it did not want to gain the second one. Again, the first one's exothermic, the second one is highly endothermic. And so this lie we've told you about sodium wanting to lose electrons and oxygen wanting to gain electrons, again, sodium didn't really want to lose electrons, but if you're going to pick somebody, you might as well pick somebody who loses them more easily than other elements like the alkali metals. And oxygen didn't want to gain two electrons, he just wanted to gain the first one, not necessarily the second one. So, but it turns out the real driving factor in forming sodium oxide here is that now you've got a cation, now you've got an anion, and their attraction to each other uh, is what really is the driving force for forming an ionic compound from a metal and a non-metal, as we'll see in the next chapter. So that's all there is to electron affinity. So again, it's the energy change associated with gaining an electron. And again, notice that word affinity. A lot of people just like to remember, oh, it's, uh, you know, how, how much an atom loves electrons or something like this. So again, it's got a very technical definition. It is the energy change associated with gaining an electron in the gaseous state. So when the gaseous atom turns into a gaseous anion, in this case. Uh, we'll contrast that now with electronegativity.
So now we'll talk about electronegativity and we'll use the periodic table. And so first thing you should know is that fluorine is king. Fluorine is the most electronegative element on the periodic table. So, uh, but you gotta say, well, okay, that's great, Chad, but what does it mean? So, well, it turns out we're gonna talk about covalent bonding in the next chapter. And it's when uh, typically two nonmetals are bonded to each other and they're sharing electrons. And so let's say we draw a bond like this and we're gonna learn how to draw structures in the next chapter. So we're jumping the gun just a little. So, but I, I wanna get all the trends covered at the same time. A lot of books won't even cover electronegativity until the next chapter, but we're gonna cover it here, at least to get the general trend out of the way. And so it turns out that this line here is gonna represent a bond, so which represents shared electrons between carbon and fluorine. So sometimes they'll write electrons as dots. We'll learn how to draw what are called Lewis dot structures in the next chapter. Well, it turns out these electrons aren't gonna be shared evenly. So it turns out whoever is more electronegative uh, is gonna pull the electrons closer to them. And again, we said fluorine is king. And so these electrons aren't gonna be like, you know, halfway in between. What we'll find out is that the electrons are gonna sp spend more time hanging out closer to fluorine, less time hanging out closer to uh, carbon. Now, if the electrons are completely transferred over to fluorine, it would have a negative one charge and carbon would have a positive one charge. But it turns out there's not a complete transfer here. They're sharing them. They're just not sharing them equally. And as a result, instead of having a full negative one charge, the fluorine here is going to have a partial negative charge. So some sort of fractional charge, if you will, like, you know, minus one fourth or something like this. And on the other hand, carbon's going to have a partial positive charge. And so this is the Greek letter delta. We use it to, uh, to symbolize partial, same uh, symbol for like partial derivatives if you ever took like an advanced calc course or something like that. Um, so, but this is partially positive and partially negative. And it just means again that we don't have a full separation of charge. It's not a full plus one and a full minus one. It's just gonna be partial charges. And it turns out the bigger the difference in electronegativity, so the more partial, the greater the, the amount of partial charges we're gonna have. And it turns out we call it a polar bond. And we'll review that more in the next chapter, don't worry. So, uh, but it turns out if the difference in electronegativity gets large enough here, it turns out we'll end up calling it an ionic bond. And that usually happens, that difference in electronegativity gets large enough, typically when you have a metal combined with a non-metal. And we'll again review that in the next chapter. But the big thing you should realize here is that the general trend for electronegativity here is again increasing towards fluorine from both directions. So notice it doesn't increase all the way up to helium. We leave the noble gases out of here. It turns out they don't really form bonds and stuff, so it's not really appropriate to talk about their electronegativities, but it increases towards fluorine. So as you go up a group and as you go left to right, you get increases in electronegativity. And, and typically, again, the closer you are to fluorine, the more electronegative. Now, you should definitely know that fluorine is number one in electronegativity. You should also know that oxygen is actually number two, not chlorine. Oxygen is number two. Now, number three, some teachers may want you to know number three as well, and you might actually get a differing opinion on who's the third. And uh, if you look up values you know, online and stuff like that, you might be led to think that chlorine is just slightly higher than nitrogen. I, I, I put these both on your hand as 3.0 because I don't want to enter the debate here. So, but some values for chlorine are actually like 3.1 and are just slightly higher than nitrogen. Although size plays a, a big role in this as well. And so a lot of biochemists are like, oh, oh, you should not be putting chlorine higher than nitrogen. Nitrogen's smaller and you should definitely give him a higher value. And, whatever, I'm not putting, like I said, I'm not putting my hat in the ring. So they're really close and one of them's higher in, in depending on, you know, on some lists and things of a sort. I, like I said, I'm not getting there. But in general, you should know that if I give you all the members of a period like boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, the closer you get to fluorine going to the right, the more electronegative. Same thing if I give you all the members of a group. If I give you iodine, bromine, chlorine, fluorine, again, as you go up the group, they get more electronegative. Cool, that's the general trend for electronegativity. And again, what it exactly is and some things that can tell us about the polarity of a bond and stuff like that, we will cover that in chapter eight. So don't think, you know, I, I realize I'm being a little vague on electronegativity here, but we're really gonna cover what it is in more detail in the next chapter. And I will remind you of the trend. But for now, just know again that fluorine is king. It's the most electronegative element and oxygen is second. And after that, the closer you get towards fluorine on the periodic table, the more electronegative that element is gonna be. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, consider hitting that like button. That will just make sure that YouTube again shares this lesson with other students who will benefit as well. And if you're looking for practice problems on this and anything in Gen Chem, I've got uh, quizzes, chapter tests, practice final exams, final exam rapid reviews, all part of my general chemistry master course. Uh, free trials available. I'll leave a link in the description. Happy studying.